Hello and welcome to Human Ascension with Ellie. It's great to be back after two weeks of recouping from my surgery. I'm doing great, by the way, and I'm just about ready to get back to normal, normal, instead of just normal. Anyway, today I wanted to talk about something that caught my attention just before I went into hospital. It was great timing, actually, uh, because now I've had a couple of weeks to slow down a little bit and look at this subject and, and gather a kind of a deep dive perspective about some of the info around it. The topic I'm talking about is related to the question of whether or not the earth is being run by a secret or clandestine shadow government, but not a shadowy government of humans. No, what I'm talking about is the possibility that earth is being run by a shadowy government of extraterrestrials. In being able to express this story, I'm going to refer to two different men who span different periods of time and have two different connected stories to tell. The first of these men is a fellow called Paul Hellier. Paul Hellier was born in August of 1923 in Waterfords, Ontario in Canada. Um, he was an, a Canadian engineer, a politician, a writer and a commentator. He was the longest serving member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada all the way up until the time of his death in 2021. Throughout his life, Paul was a man of politics. His political career spanned something around 20, oh, pardon me, 70 something years. So all in all, Paul Hellier was reasonably credible, I would say, as a political character and respected by others in the political world. The only problem is that unexpectedly at the age of 82, Paul made headlines by publicly announcing that he believed in the existence of UFOs. The Ottawa Citizen newspaper reports that uh, Paul had begun demanding that world governments disclose alien technology that could be used to solve problems of climate change. In an interview with RT, which is now Russia Today in uh, 2014, Paul stated that he believed there were four different species of aliens that had been living on Earth for thousands of years. Most of them came from other star systems, although there were still some living on Venus, Mars, and also on Saturn's moons. Now, recently, I've watched Paul Hillier give a presentation, which I think was done very shortly prior to his death, um, relating to a couple of UFO-related incidents that you might have, you might already be aware of. One in particular occurred towards the end of World War II, around the time of the US's Operation Paperclip. Now, Operation Paperclip was originally convened by President Harry Truman under a different title for the purposes of studying the surprisingly advanced technological know-how that seemed to be coming out of the Nazis during the war. President Truman approved Operation Paperclip as a program, but included a caveat. He said that he did not want any Nazis involved in the program. His caveat was ignored by the US Office of Strategic Studies, which went looking for people to, to participate in the program. They were looking for scientists and engineers with a background in military rockets development, aviation, and chemical and biological warfare, all the really scary stuff, okay? So as it turns out, quite a number of the participants ended up coming from a Nazi background. At some point during Operation Paperclip, it became evident that the Nazis were becoming a bigger problem than had originally been anticipated. They were advancing and appeared to be strengthening and their explanation of how they were making this possible was unclear. There was also a period of time described by Paul where the Nazis moved in and captured some of the scientists working with Operation Paperclip and they transferred those or abducted those scientists and transferred them to a secret location somewhere in Antarctica. Now, obviously, this action by the Nazis was considered to be unacceptable by the US and its allies. And so the United States convened 13 military ships and 4,700 Marines to Antarctica to find the Nazis and the stolen scientists. It was somehow in that period of time during which the US and the Nazis were actually engaged in fighting. When it's reported that suddenly out of nowhere, a number of flying saucers appeared to rise from the ocean and become visible in the sky. As a result of this sighting um, and probably other things, the United States aborted their mission and left early and returned to the US. 
But that base in Antarctica, which was originally run by the Nazis, well, apparently, according to Paul, it's still there. I don't know whether it's operating anything, but it appears to physically still be in place. So fast forward around 10 years, Paul Hellyer is still working in government and the Roswell UFO crash incident occurs. The way it's described by Paul is that a number of flying saucers crashed in Arizona and the crash was witnessed by a number of people. One of the flying saucers was retrieved by the US military. At the time of the crash, the newspapers reported quite spontaneously the time and the place and described the incident as it had been described by the various witnesses who saw the crash. But a few hours later, the military conducted a press conference about the same incident. And during this time, they said that there was no such thing as flying saucers. <laughs> of course they did. And that what the people had actually seen was just a weather balloon. Hmm. Okay. So Paul Hillier claims that there was a survivor of the Roswell crash, an extraterrestrial who was retained by the US government. He learned to speak English, which is phenomenal, and explained that he came from a binary star system in the southern constellation of Reticulum <laughs> called Zeta Reticuli. Paul Hellier also claims that although it was highly classified at some point in his life, he was able to listen to a taped recording between this extraterrestrial creature and the nurse who was tending to him at the time. I don't know. Paul has recounted one particular section of the recording as being very memorable to him because in it, the ET was explaining how humans were not taking sufficient care of the planet and were trying to ruin it or were maybe not trying, but were actually ruining it. Now hold this thought because that destruction of the planet is something that links many of these stories. The way that Paul Hillier describes it, both the United States and the former uh, Russian USSR both sold their souls, I say in inverted commas, for the purpose of gaining ET expertise and technology. Later, when Ike Eisenhower became president, he had some direct experiences, apparently, with extraterrestrials, it seems, and they had supposedly offered him the good life by giving him the technology and medical and agricultural expertise that he wanted in exchange for a promise that humans would give up their atomic weapons. Well, as you can probably guess by today's, you know, threats in the world, Eisenhower did not agree to those terms. If you're not aware of the claims of President Eisenhower having a direct interaction with extraterrestrials, there's plenty of information about that that you can find on the internet and probably also here in other shows on KGRA. Another thing that may be noteworthy is that since the Roswell incident, President Eisenhower actually asked to go there on a number of occasions to view the site himself, but the military wouldn't allow him to go. It's kind of like they had a say on the matter or they were in control. Anyway, Eisenhower was furious because obviously as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces in Europe and Commander-in-Chief of the US Armed Forces, nobody was willing to tell him anything about what was taking place in Roswell. And so he threatened to send in the army from Colorado. And it was on that basis of his threat that the military agreed to give him access to CIA assets who were permitted to look around and report back to the president what was taking place in Roswell. What those CIA assets came back with was that the United States supposedly was back engineering a flying saucer of ET origin. Now, this is the story by Paul Hellyer. Whether or not it's true or whether it's conjecture, I'm not really sure. The way Paul describes it, ETs are very concerned about atomic weapons. The cosmos is a whole thing. And every time someone sets off a bomb, it affects the entire cosmos. They were terribly concerned after the first bomb was dropped in Hiroshima in 1945. And of course, the money showed up soon after Roswell. Um, it was Rockefeller who somehow managed to gain access to some of the ET knowledge, supposedly, and he set things up so that private industry would be able to access some of this knowledge. Interestingly, when Ike Eisenhower left the presidency, he made a statement that has since been argued as the kind of cryptic warning um, of some kind about the relationship of convenience between ETs and US private industry. Eisenhower's statement went something along the lines of, and I quote, 
beware of the industrialized military, unquote. Many people believe that this statement was a declaration of warning that ETs had taken over the military and that extraterrestrial technology had fallen into the wrong hands here on Earth. Interestingly, Eisenhower is not the only one to have said something cryptic of that nature. Bill Clinton also said uh, once that there is a shadow government inside the government that he appears to have no control over. And also, former Senator for Hawaii, Daniel K. Inui, once said, and I quote, there exists a shadowy government with its own air force, its own military, its own fundraising and mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself, unquote. So it sounds a little as though the implication made by Paul Hellyer is that there is a shadow government running everything that links in some way to the extraterrestrial phenomena. But I still don't really have enough information now to be able to make a judgment um, about that. So let's keep going and let's see if we can find something else. So let's now talk about a fellow who you may not have heard of, even though he's been around for a very long time and he's been talking about the same thing consistently over and over again for many years. And the man I'm talking about is a fellow from Berkeley in California called Marshall Vian Summers. Marshall Vian Summers, actually, let's call him Marshall, was born in January of 1949. He came from an Episcopalian family, but he explains that his family didn't really put much emphasis on religion when he was growing up. They really just considered themselves to be Christian, but without it entering their lives much on a day-to-day -day basis. A little bit like my family is the same way. Um, Marshall grew up in a pretty normal way from what I understand. And when he was old enough to go to university, he studied music and English at the University of California in Berkeley. After graduating, he became a teacher for the blind, blind children to be specific. He spent his career teaching children to communicate and acting as a general educator, but also as a companion and counsellor in some ways. Marshall describes his job as having been one in which he developed a keen sense of empathy, which I guess would be for obvious reasons, and then later a kind of sensitivity um, towards his own inner guidance. I guess you could say it was like a gut feeling or an intuition or a state of knowing that many people around the world feel to, um, that they have, including myself. It was this gut feeling or inner guidance that would cause Marshall to sometimes feel the need to retreat out into the wilderness um, in, in areas of the American Southwest to be able to experience nature to meditate in natural surroundings, and to sort of gain the feeling or experience of being grounded to the earth. It was during those periods of time when he was out in the wilderness that he began to encounter what he relates to as an angelic presence. Over the course of the next 35 to 40 years, Marshall claimed that the angelic presence that he was encountering was instructing him to record messages that he now refers to as divine revelation. Today, Marshall Vian Summers considers the angelic presence to be a group of representatives of, of God that live outside of the earthly plane. He says that they have made it clear that they have never been to earth in a physical manner, that they have no intention of ever coming to earth in a physical manner, but they have been acting as guardians for humanity. In fact, Marshall has coined the phrase allies of humanity to describe his multi-diverse celestial group of guardians. Marshall says that he has never seen this angelic presence face to face. They are unseeable, um, apparently, but his communications with them have been prolific and have spanned a number of decades. Collectively, the material that he's now published, which he claims is a direct recording of the messages provided by these allies of humanity is collectively produced under the banner of being called the new message of God. The new message of God, uh, in very brief summary, claims that in, in quite intricate detail that humanity is on the threshold of emerging into a highly competitive greater community of intellectual life but is socially dissolute and environmentally compromised, which leaves us entirely unprepared for what we're about to encounter. 
Marshall compares our current situation of unpreparedness as being similar to that which was experienced by the indigenous American Indian tribes during the first settlement of the, of the Americas by white foreigners, where they watched the arrival and the intervention of this new unfamiliar white race with curiosity rather than fear. They also believed what they were told by the white settlers and subsequently were taken advantage of by those settlers who were in fact proven to be more along the lines of invaders rather than friends. Um, I want to read you something that appears under the writings of M Marshall V. N. Summers. It's sort of, well, it's a very concise capturing of his overall message. So here goes. Okay. Now I'm quoting this bit. A greater darkness is in the world. It is unlike anything that humanity has ever faced before. Contact has begun, but it is contact with a dark purpose. In addition, we are facing converging waves of great change, including climate change, environmental deterioration, diminishing food and energy resources, and the growing threat of conflict and war. My message has come from the angels of the creator, who are urgently attempting to enable humanity to recognize this and to prepare for encountering these new realities with wisdom and sobriety. These are the greatest events in human history, but humanity is unprepared." End quote. As a result of his encounters, which began in around 1983, from what I understand, Marshall spent the first 10 years or so recording these supposed messages. But then in 1992, he opened a center um, called the Worldwide Community of the New Message of God. He did set himself up and he does have worldwide adherents that believe that he is a prophet of some kind on the same level as the prophets Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad are considered to be. This is on the basis of the fact that he claims to have been in direct receipt of an un otherworldly communication with the powers to be able to change the course of humanity here on earth, if only we would listen. In total, Marshall V. N. Suthers has transcribed something in the vicinity of 10,000 pages of communication with this angelic presence. Now, in very simple terms, the concept of the new message of God is, uh, that was received by Marshall Summers can be summarized quite simply. Basically, and this of course is a very simplified uh, version of the messages. So basically the message is that humanity is in disarray because it is destroying its environment and destroying each other. It is a terribly divided um, race that has lost its way. As a result of this, humanity has become very vulnerable. And for a long period, as much as hundreds of years, maybe even longer, Earth has been under the surveillance of a number of different extraterrestrial beings from various different planets and solar systems that are all vying collectively for the richness and rare resources that the Earth has to offer. There is an intergalactic constitution that can't be breached. And for that reason, these extraterrestrials that are coveting the resources of Earth can't physically intervene into Earth in a manner which would be hostile. At the same time, however, Earth is one of those sweet anomalies in the universe that provides the rare and precious resources that are needed by alien civilizations all over the galaxy that have either depleted their own resources or suffered intergalactic difficult times or for some other reason have evolved in such a way as to now be in this age of almost desperate survival situation. They need what Earth has, but they're not under the constitution of the galaxies permitted to come in and just take it. The only way that they can get what they need is to convince the owners of the Earth which of course is humanity, to willingly give up what they've got. And so for the past um, few years, the new message from God is that humans have been getting groomed to increasingly accept and feel comfortable with the possibility of a visitation and a co-mingling and co-inhabitation with alien beings. The infiltration into society has been deliberate and it's Machiavellian in nature because it's designed to give us a sense of security as though extraterrestrials are here to help us, 
and are here to share their knowledge and wisdom and technology with us and to assist us in being able to ascend to a high level of existence. According to Marshall V. and Summers and the Allies of Humanity, however, this is not true. This is a manipulation in order to soften humanity into opening the door and saying, yes, come to our home and take what you need. Because under the intergalactic constitution, if the residents and owners of a planet allow you to come into their home and take their resources, well, then what you're doing is you're doing it with the permission of the owners. The angelic beings describe this diverse group of extraterrestrial beings as forming a collective called the greater community. And their intention is apparently not visitation so much as intervention. The angelic beings that comprise the allies of humanity, on the other hand, are not extraterrestrials as we would understand them to be. They are literally an angelic presence. The reason why this distinction um, interests me is because the interaction that Marshall claims that he's had with these allies of humanity is, um, and this collective voice, is that it's sort of like an amalgamation in some way of a variety of different types of angelic presences all working together on behalf of the creator. And he's never seen these presences, but they still appear to him in a similar way as the Chris Bledsoe experience has occurred. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with Chris Bledsoe, I would urge you to start listening to this radio show from the beginning. His story appears in some detail in episode one of the show. I've called that first episode Convergence, if you want to find it easily. I also talk about Chris off and on in subsequent episodes. And I, I have a playlist devoted to Chris Bledsoe's experiences in the Ellie Dreams Done Under channel on YouTube. However, briefly, Chris is a man who claims that nearly 20 years ago, he had an initial encounter of lights in the sky and an extraterrestrial sighting that appeared to have followed him home. And over the course of the next 15 to 20 years, he developed into this developed into an ongoing interaction or even a relationship with an angelic presence that he refers to as the lady in white. Well, there are a lot of similarities between the Chris Bledsoe story and Marshall Vian Summers and his story. The differences really do lie in how they have moved forward after their experiences in different ways. Chris Bledsoe went home, talked to his local community, tried to engage in discussion about what had, um, he had experienced, and generally he got shut down by the people around him that he had known for years. However, he did spike the interest of the US government and as a result of that, he now goes down in history as being uh, probably one of the most closely examined and tested UFO or extraterrestrial experiences of all time. On the other hand, Marshall Vian Summers also retreated to his own private space, but he began recording all of the messages that he had been receiving. And then after approximately 10 years of consistent communication with this angelic presence, he started coming out of his shell and ultimately opened a spiritual organization and started preaching this new revelation that he claimed he had received, a new revelation a little bit like a new Bible for a new age of existence, perhaps. Marshall Summers Society for the New Message of God is a religious non-profit organization which is both the publisher of Marshall Summers books and recordings which are now printed under the title of the New Knowledge Library. Uh, and it's also a religious order. Marshall Summers and his son, Reed Summers, work together particularly in the external communications area of the society. They find an audience among those who have shared interests as they do. They speak on subjects um, that include, for example, spirituality, prophecy, extraterrestrial life, destiny, the purpose of life, and humanity's relationships, and the concept of striving for inner peace. They also talk about exotheology. And for anyone who isn't aware of what exotheology is, it's the phrase that was coined in around about the 60s or 70s, and it relates to the examination of theological issues as they pertain to extraterrestrial intelligence. It's primarily concerned with either the possibility of theology being a coded expression of extraterrestrial visitation or of theology and extraterrestrial life having been related in other ways. Um, if you haven't heard about 
Marshall Vian Summers, you may be surprised to hear that he is a prolific writer. He's written over 20 books and manuscripts, all of which have been published, and his writings have been translated so far from English into, I think it's around about 35 different languages from around the world. He's not a secret to anyone. However, he's not well known, even when it comes to the extraterrestrial enthusiast communities. And what makes him, that, that kind of makes him really interesting because what it demonstrates is that, that he's not striving to become famous like some people do, you know, as we know. He has maintained a consistent message for 40 years on the basis of what he claims are first-hand messages um, that were received from an otherworldly presence, which is angelic in nature and directly linked to the creator of humanity. The thing about what Marshall Summers says is it does seem to sort of resonate in a way, and I'm, I'm looking at it from a relatively superficial standpoint, of course, but I've, reached, I've researched him significantly, and, you know, he's produced 10,000 pages worth of writing, so I've not had an opportunity to read all of those 10,000 pages. However, I have read a lot, and what is written um, does seem logical, which makes him very interesting. Um, I think it's important to link the things that he says to the claims that are being made by extraterrestrial experiences or UFO abductees and also some spiritual experiences. For example, there are countless people across the world that claim that they were abducted by the extraterrestrial beings that we know of as the greys. And in almost every instance, the encounter is not a pleasant one. This is very much in keeping with what Marshall Vian Summers is saying. He says that there is an exercise taking place which is in agreement with the small segment of governments around the world or perhaps military segments of governments around the world where extraterrestrials have been granted permission to experiment on and test a certain percentage of humans in exchange for sharing technology and wisdom with those governments. And the people that they're being licensed to interfere with have no idea that they have been chosen. It's as though someone in these worldwide series of governments has said, okay, you can tamper with a few of our people. Let's just say, you know, 1% of the population. And in return for that, we'd like to be able to back engineer some of your technology. And so this has been agreed. What Marshall Summers says is that ETs have no sense of kindness or kinship with the human race whatsoever. And the evidence of that is in the fact that the abductees routinely complain of being terrified and traumatized by their experiences. On the other hand, individuals who are exposed to an angelic presence, such as the lady in white that Chris Bledsoe has encountered, or the allies of humanity that Marshall Vian Summers has repeatedly encountered, well, those people claim to be in the presence of pure love. And so when you listen to Marshall's story, and what he claims to be true, it comes across as being very believable because it fits with the independent reports of experiences around the world. For example, of the many, many hundreds and thousands of people who claim to have been abducted by surprise, by alien beings, I mean, how many do we know of that actually thought it was a positive experience that they thoroughly enjoyed and walked away from feeling refreshed and vibrant and loved? I mean, I can think of, I don't know, maybe five or 10 people across the world. And so immediately, because the numbers are so small, it begins to sort of make me wonder whether or not these are actual encounters, these five or 10 people, or whether they're just sort of made up. And that the reality is, it's instead of this fantasy storyline of a really kind alien abducting you and, and then you ended up feeling better uh, and you're using it as a talking point, overwhelmingly, People who claim to have been abducted, who've been taken by surprise, they're taken unwillingly, they have to be frozen or disabled in order to be taken away against their will, they've been experimented on against their will, and they return to Earth feeling brutalised and traumatised by the experience. And this sounds like the kind of experience that you would have if you were being taken by a heartless, hostile entity rather than a friendly, loving entity who was hoping to save you from yourself. For this reason, and I'm not saying that I agree with Marshall Vian Summers because obviously I need to do more research um, than that. But, but, you know, 
I, I have to get to know everything he has to say and I need to read all of the material, which is a lot, and, and see all of his interviews. However, it is very hard to ignore him because what he says fits with what is being reported elsewhere around the world. It also appears to validate the idea that there's more than one kind of presence that sits outside of the earthly realm. There is the extraterrestrial extraterrestrial physical element that exists and then there is this ethereal almost holographic angelic presence as well and more often than not the experiences of the extraterrestrial variety are surprisingly unexpected and traumatic and the experiences of the angelic presence are unexpected sure but filled with love and comfort and compassion uh, but also those ones are coupled with warnings about the extraterrestrials I find this really interesting. Marshall Van Summers also says that part of the warnings that he's received are that the ET enthusiasts who are vying for disclosure are celebrating this concept of extraterrestrial life and visitation to Earth and cohabitation with humans as being a positive thing, something that humans can learn from that will help them to ascend and, and will help them to be able to take care of the earth and, and take care of ourselves and become better human beings, more evolved human beings and, and a more evolved race of humans. And Marshall Summers says that this is actually a misconception and that it is a deliberate thing. It's by deliberate design that humanity is being encouraged to feel this way because it means that we will let our guard down. The intention is that once humanity's guard is down sufficiently, which he claims is going to happen very, very soon, in fact, then an intervention is going to take place. And the purpose of the intervention is to take over the earth in such a way as to directly benefit from its resources. You know, this reminds me of a dream that I had about two weeks ago. Just before I went into hospital, I had a dream that I was following around an unearthly being and I was trying to talk to them a little bit like I was a member of the paparazzi. And then they suddenly turned around and gave me a brief message that I didn't understand at the time, but it kind of makes sense now. I woke up from the dream and immediately um, texted the message to myself verbatim in my mobile phone. The message, you know, it really was very brief. It didn't make any sense at all. It simply said, and I quote, they don't have to build, unquote. At the time, like I said, it didn't make much sense to me. But that dream was the night before. And then the next day, one of my viewers on the Ellie Dreams and another channel sent me a link to a Marshall VN Summers interview. I'd never heard of him before. But I watched the interview, which I found kind of interesting. So then I found another interview somewhere and it sent me down this rabbit hole as 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 happens and you may or may not be like me but yeah I love a good rabbit hole there is something that I've seen in one of the Marshall V and Summers uh, interviews where he said uh, I want to make sure I get this right okay he said that what makes earth so attractive and humanity very attractive to the extraterrestrials is that we have this beautiful, resource-rich planet, but we have also built it up with infrastructure so that it can be utilised. We have scientific establishments and our knowledge of technology is also growing. We already have the infrastructure in place that makes us a very attractive workforce for extraterrestrials. Marshall says in one of the messages that he received from these allies of humanity that the ETs are intending to put us to work so the whole idea is that in a very short space of time, they're planning to intervene at Earth. They couldn't do it forcibly because of the galactic constitution. So they have been manipulating us via proxies who are either paid off or have also been manipulated themselves. And this manipulation has been going on for hundreds of years. We are very close to being ready to accept a visitation, which of course they intend to give us very soon but not so much an invita a visitation, it's more of an intervention. And by that time, we will be wel welcoming it with open arms. They will enter our planet, infiltrate society, and harness the human race. They will have us work for them as a physical workforce, and they will be reaping the rewards. So basically, they're manipulating us into becoming their slave labor. Now, I just thought that was an interesting thing to mention because obviously the day before I 
I discovered Marshall Van Summers even existed. I had that dream that included the message that they don't have to build. No, they don't have to build because we've already built the infrastructure for them. And that is something that Marshall has directly stated. He says that ETs find it very beneficial that we've already done a lot of the building work that would be needed. Now, the missing link here that coincides with Paul Hellier's recounting of UFO-related events, which is also mentioned by Marshall Vian Summers, is that ETs do appear to be actively intervening in order to prevent us from using nuclear weapons because the Earth's resources need to be preserved. But Marshall is clear about this. He says the ETs are not protecting us. They don't care about us, according to Marshall. They want to protect the Earth because they have a stake in its survival. In the meantime, they're creating a hybrid race that can survive on Earth. This is something that Marshall Summers says is part of the messaging that he's received. And so when I think about all of the similarities between the Marshall V. and Summers encounter and teachings and revelations that he claims came from an angelic presence um, working on behalf of the Creator, it seems so logical and it seems to so closely uh, relate to many of the encounters that are being reported in a variety of other different places all over the world. And it's even just as the lady in white told Chris Bledsoe when she claims that she and other angelic beings had been, and I quote, holding a dark force at bay, unquote. And so I thought that it would be worthwhile spending a bit of time in this episode doing a word for word read of one of the messages received by Marshall Vian Summers. And so I'm going to do that now. This is a direct quote, quite lengthy, um, as it was received by Marshall Vian Summers on May 27th, 2011, while he was in Boulder, Colorado. The body of content that I'm about to read is a word for word transcript of the message received, but the title of the message was created by Marshall. He called it Entering the Greater Community, and this is the first time I'm reading it myself. So it's going to be new for me as well as for you. So let's begin. God's new revelation opens the door to a universe of intelligent life, providing perspective, insight, and understanding never available before. The human family does not realize its vulnerability to this greater community, nor its relationship with this greater community. Living in isolation for so very long, your whole notion of yourself, your notion of creation and the divine are very much associated with this one world alone. And yet so many people in the world today have roots in the greater community for much of their previous experience occurred there before coming into this world in this life. It is like you are an isolated tribe never discovered by the outer world not knowing the greater powers that exist around you and completely unprepared for the day that your existence would be discovered from the outside. But of course, humanity has been broadcasting out into space, quite foolishly, of course, and so your presence is well known to neighbours and to other groups who are watching the world with great interest. For some, you have been studied for a very long time. While they might find your deeper nature incomprehensible, your outward behaviour can be easily discerned and is quite predictable. You are standing at the threshold of an entirely different reality, a non-human universe, a universe where human values and aspirations are not universally shared, a universe where your existence and where your importance are of little or no consequence, except to those races who either seek to support human freedom in the world or those races who seek to take it from you. The greater community will alter how you see yourself, how nations here interact with one another and the whole priority of humanity. Its impact can be extremely beneficial if you can understand it correctly. For it is the greater community that will finally persuade your nations to cooperate, to unite for the preservation of the world and the protection of the human family. It is the greater community that will show you that you cannot afford your ceaseless conflicts here on earth that your resources here are precious and your self-sufficiency is of the greatest importance. With this awareness, you would not continue to squander the world at the terrible pace that you are doing so now. 
you would not foolishly think the universe is there for the taking once you exhaust the wealth of this world. You would understand that this world is all that you have. This world, this solar system is all that you have. Beyond this, you are entering regions owned or controlled by others, and you cannot take this from them. You do not know the rules of engagement in the universe or the relations between the nations or what is allowed and what is not allowed in this greater community of life. You are like the child entering the metropolis, innocent, assuming, unaware. People want many things from visitors here. They expect many things. People feel they are very important in the universe and that others would naturally come here to help you or to give you what you wanted and needed. People think contact is kind of a thrilling adventure, a holiday from the mon mundanity of human life. They want to think of this contact, that it would be very positive and beneficial because they do not have the strength or the courage or the preparation to consider it in any other way. God's revelation is providing you a window into this greater community of life, a window that only God could provide, for there is nothing in the universe that God is not aware of. No race can certainly make such a claim. No race has the comprehension of even this one galaxy. No race has a comprehension of the deeper nature of humanity. Even those new races in this region of space who are free and self-determined, even they cannot fully understand what human nature really means. But everyone in the universe is seeking resources, and the more technologically advanced nations are very dependent upon this. You do not reach a place where this need ceases to exist because as you advance technologically, the needs um, escalate in order to respond to it. Humanity does not know it is at a great threshold, a great turning point, a turning point that will create a future unlike the past. Living in a declining world, a world of declining resources and shrinking opportunities, you do not see your great vulnerability to space. Your borders are unguarded. Your people are unaware. Your governments are subsumed in their internal difficulties and problems with one another. This world, such a beautiful place, so rich biologically with so many important resources that are difficult to find in a universe of barren worlds. The revelation from God must awaken you to the realities, the difficulties and the opportunities of emerging into a greater community of life. None of God's previous revelations were required to do this because the need was not there. But you now have a global civilization, diffracted, conflicted, destructive, heedless and irresponsible. But it is a world community nonetheless. You have global communication, you have a global commerce and for many people a growing global awareness. It is at this point that intervention will be attempted. It is at this point that humanity becomes a prize to be claimed. For those who will come here and who are here already cannot live in the biologically complex world that you inhabit and to which you are adapted. They need human assistance. They need human allegiance. They need human participation in order to gain sovereignty and control here. And they will take advantage of your expectations, your desires, your fantasies and your grievances to establish this position for themselves. Look at the history of intervention in your world. Look how easily native people succumb to the presence of foreign intervention. This must not be your fate. If you begin to think within this larger arena of life, you will begin to see things you could not see before, and you will see that human unity and cooperation are not simply a desirable future goal or a preferred option, but instead a necessity to assure the freedom and the future of the human family. The intervention seeks not to destroy you, but to use you, to use you for their own purposes. This is a reality you cannot escape and the deception that will be cast upon the human family and the pacification that it will cast upon the human family to submit, to acquiesce, are very strong and compelling. Having lost faith in human leadership and institutions, people will look to other powers in the universe to guide them believing fervently that a beneficial force will come here to restore and to save humanity from itself. It is this expectation, this desire, however unconscious it might be, that the intervention will utilize for its own purposes. Your freedom is precious. To whatever extent it has been established in the world, it has been gained through great effort and human sacrifice. 
it must be protected with great vigilance. You are concerned only with each other in this regard, but now you have greater concerns. And with those concerns, a greater need to become educated about the life in the universe and prepared for the meaning of this difficult and hazardous engagement. Those who are allied to humanity, the free races, they will not intervene here, for intervention to them is a violation. They realize that even if they could gain your confidence and trust, they would have to maintain a controlling presence here in order to guide you into the greater community. This they cannot do. They realize that humanity will have to struggle and suffer, even to come to a point of recognition and responsibility regarding its future and destiny here. They can only advise. They will send their briefings, the briefings from the allies of humanity. This they have done as part of God's new revelation. For the creator knows that you must realize that you are not totally alone in the universe and that freedom and self-determination exist and have been achieved by others. But this is not an easy achievement and it has basic requirements. People are shocked by these things, not because they're untrue or even that they seem sensational, but because they have never been thinking about it and they do not even really want to think about it. It is so big and complex and challenging. But this is your world. This is why you have come. You did not come to sleep on a beautiful planet, but to help preserve it and protect the human family from decline and from subjugation. Human conflict is wasting you away. Ignorant, foolish, and unaware of what exists at your borders, human conflict is wasting you away. It is time for humanity to mature, to grow up, to realize that you are living in a greater community of life, a greater community you cannot control, a greater community that is beyond your efforts, your technology, and even your comprehension. That is why the creator of all life, is bringing the revelation about the greater community into the world. It is time now as humanity stands at the brink of a declining world, a world of declining resources and growing economic and political upheaval and instability, a time when the religious of the world have become partisans in an ongoing conflict and competition for human acceptance and leadership, a time when the poorer nations are running out of resources and the rich nations are falling into great indebtedness. It is the perfect time for intervention. It is the necessary time for a great human awareness to emerge and with it a greater responsibility to the world, not just to one's nation or one's group or one's religious affiliation, but to all of humanity. For if nations fail, the whole world could fail. If intervention is successful in one part of the world, it threatens the future of everyone here. People are full of grievance. They are full of needs. They are full of, in some cases, desperate needs of poverty and oppression. The leaders of the world are either blind or cannot communicate what they have been told, what they see and what they know. So the people of the nations remain ignorant about the greatest event in human history, the greatest challenge to human freedom and sovereignty and the greatest opportunity for human unity and cooperation. For you will not be able to engage with a greater community of life as a warring and conflicted set of tribes and nations. You will have no strength and efficacy here, and your vulnerability will be so apparent to others. Humanity is destroying the wealth of the world, and that too has prompted intervention. There is so much for you to learn. It cannot be communicated in a few words, but in a great series of teachings which are part of God's revelation. Here, a Christian must become a Christian with a greater community awareness. A Muslim becomes a Muslim with a greater community awareness. A Buddhist and a Jew gain a greater panorama of view to which their religious teachings must become relevant. If religion in the world is to educate and to enlighten, it must have this greater capacity and awareness. You cannot be falling around in the face of the greater community or in the face of the great waves of change that are already occurring in the world. It's time to grow up. Humanity has great strengths. You have not lost your connection to the deeper knowledge that exists within each person. You have not become a regimented, secular, technological society, which is so common in the universe. You have not lost your freedom or your greater sensibilities entirely, although that is being threatened with each passing day. 
The needs of life are fundamental everywhere. Advanced technology does not relieve you of these needs entirely and in fact can escalate them tremendously. Do you think that great technological societies in the universe are not desperate for resources, resources that they now cannot create themselves but must trade and negotiate for from far, far away? They have lost their self-determination. They are controlled now by the very networks of trade upon which they depend. To be free in the universe, you must be self-sufficient, you must be united, and you must be very discreet. Those are the requirements that every nation, every world, every race must establish in a greater community of life. Here you can see the danger and the seduction of humanity receiving technology and resources from beyond the world. What a, what a great attraction that would be. What a great seduction that is. Once you lose your self-sufficiency, everything is lost that you value. For you will not be able to establish the terms of engagement to gain access to those things upon which you have now become dependent. Other nations will determine your behavior and your participation. It is a fact of life. You cannot take your local universe by conquest because you will be opposed by everyone. This is a very different picture from your movies and your science fiction and your fantasies, your hopes and your unspoken expectations. This casts a very different picture on the importance of human unity and cooperation here on Earth, the importance of securing and building human freedom and the power and presence of knowledge that God has placed within each person. Here, freedom is not simply to become indulgent and unaccountable to anyone or anything else. It becomes an essential element of your participation in life. Here, your greater gifts can be called forth for you realize you are here to serve the great and imperiled needs of humanity. Here, everything within you that is true and genuine becomes activated and called for. Here, nations will cease their endless conflicts and try to create stability for themselves and their neighbors to assure their future well-being and to protect themselves against intervention from the outside. The world will not be taken by force, for that is not allowed in this part of the universe. It will be taken through seduction and persuasion, through capitalizing upon human weakness and conflict, human superstition and unfulfilled human needs. Brute force is rarely used in this part of the universe. Greater, more subtle means are employed to protect the resources of the world and to gain ascendancy through persuasion, deception, and secrecy. Humanity is still a clumsy, violent race in this regard, but even that is changing here on Earth. We give you these perspectives because this represents the love of the creator. Though it might be overwhelming or frightening at first, it is a reality to which you must become aware and accustomed. You must think now not only for yourself or for your community or for your nation, but for the whole world, because that will determine your fate and destiny and the well-being of your children and the children of the world. It is a great shift in consciousness, a great and necessary shift now. People will resist this, of course. They will take refuge in their religion. They will take refuge in their political ideology. They will take refuge in human rationality. But life in the universe is not dependent upon these things. Life is happening whether you are aware of it or not, whether you are prepared for it or not. It is not a matter of perspective. It is not a matter of ideological orientation. It is really about paying attention at being observant and objective and honest with yourself. This is a great challenge, but a necessary challenge and a redeeming challenge if it can be met honestly and sincerely. You have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, but you are not looking and you are not listening. Everyone around you seems to be obsessed, preoccupied or oppressed. Who will speak to them? Who will teach them? They may not hear. They may not hear our words. Who will speak to them? You need only point to the revelation. For you yourself cannot explain life in the universe. You yourself cannot explain the great waves of change that are coming to the world. You yourself cannot explain what human spirituality means at the level of knowledge. You yourself cannot explain wisdom and knowledge from the universe. You yourself cannot explain humanity's greater destiny and what must be done to achieve it. 
For this you must turn to the revelation, for the revelation is greater than what any one person can understand. Point to the revelation, for that alone holds the preparation for humanity's future and destiny in an emerging world. God is giving humanity what it cannot give itself. God is alerting humanity to the perils and opportunities as it stands at the threshold of space. God is alerting humanity to the dangers and the opportunities and necessities of living in a declining world. God is bringing into the world a clarification of the nature and purpose of human spirituality, a nature and purpose that has been so lost and obscured in God's previous revelations. The revelation is vast. It speaks of so many things. You cannot exhaust it and you must use it and apply it and share its reality with others. It is only then that you can see what it really means and why it is necessary and why it holds the great promise for the future and the freedom of the people of this world. For success is not assured. Many peoples in the universe have fallen under persuasion and subjugation. It has happened countless times. It is the inevitable outcome for people not being alerted and prepared to engage with a larger arena of intelligent life. Beware of your own fantasies and expectations. Question them. Consider them in light of the realities of nature and of human history. If you are honest with yourself, you must come to see that you do not know what is beyond the borders of this world and that hopeful expectations can be extremely blinding. You must be prepared for anything and everything, just as you must be prepared for anything and everything functioning in this world, in human relationships and through the activities of life itself. To be free, you must be strong. To be strong, your mind must be clear. You must see clearly. You must hear the truth. You must be objective about your life and circumstances. You must look upon the world, not with grievance or avoidance, but with compassion, patience, and determination. If you are to forge the groundwork for a new future here, to play your small but important part here, then you must have this approach. Accept this gift of love and revelation. It brings with it great responsibility, but also great strength and great promise. You are not living yet the life you were meant to live because your life is not engaged with the greater reality that lives within you and all around you. For humanity, this is a great turning point, And for you, it is a great turning point. People of the world must awaken to the greater community and to the condition of the world you live in. You must learn of your greater strength and greater wisdom that God has placed within you to guide you, to prepare you and to protect you. God has spoken again. It is for the greatest purpose to meet the greatest sets of needs. So there you have it. That is one of the messages that appears in Volume 1 of the New Message from God, as transcribed by Marshall Vian Summers. I'd really love to know what you have to think about this and whether or not you'd like me to read more of the information that he is imparting. And I'm actually going to be continuing on with a discussion about Marshall B. and Summers and the Allies of Humanity in the next hour, where I'm going to be meeting with Renee Barnett at Night Vision Radio, right after the break. So I do hope that you'll stay with us. <music> 